Good morning. We're, we're back together again. So we are in First Peter. We're going to start a new chapter today, chapter 2. So we're in First Peter, chapter 2. We're going to talk about spiritual growth, our spiritual growth as believers, in uh, verses 1 through 5. So we're in First Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it says this. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but it is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So that's our text for today. So let me just start with a, a little anecdote here. Uh, you know, I remember when I tasted for the very first time this uh, bakery abomination that most of you call angel cake. And such cake was uh, sitting there on this beautiful cake stand and it was covered with a very thick layer of icing and it was peppered with big chunks of juicy red strawberries and so i'm, I'm looking at it and there's a there's a slice of this cake that has already been cut by one of the other guests in this reunion or party that we were and then I could see that these moist and delicious innermost parts of the cake had already been uncovered. So my initial assessment concludes two things. The, the first one is I've had this before, and I like it a lot. And the second assessment was I'm going to have more than one slice regardless of how polite this is. It's going to happen. So I go there very calmly. I take, pick up a slice while secretly salivating inside my mouth, my mouth closed, I'm trying to keep my post, uh, composure. So, so I take my slide, and all the excitement and all the enthusiasm came crashing down before I finished sinking my teeth on the first bite because the top layer was not icing. It was merengue, merengue. Uh, the strawberries tasted watery, they were not sweet at all. And worst of all, this cake was 98% air and 100% disappointment. <laughs> so, as it is my custom, and I'm sure some of you here, turn to my wife, and whenever I have a disappointment or a disagreement or frustration, I immediately and unequivocally express my displeasure to my wife who after my rant, very kindly, but very firmly, she said, honey, you're thinking of pound cake. This is angel cake. So, as you can imagine, this craving that I had for cake was not satisfied. It, I, I was hungry and I was grumpy. I had been deceived by this uh, random baker in North uh, uh, Dallas. So. In the past, I had tasted and seen the goodness and the deliciousness of pound cake. And what I had in front of me looked good, it smelled good, but it did not taste good at all. So you see this angel cake was not satisfying because it was full of fluff. It was full of air. There was no substance in it. So this is something related to what we're going to see in our lesson today, when fluff and air is not satisfying. There's no substance in it. So in our section today, we're going to see that uh, this, this uh, lesson is divided in two sections. And both of them speak, of course, about the Lord Jesus Christ and the connection that we have with him. So verses 1 and 2 are going to be connected with each other mostly because they are one sentence. Even though they're divided in two, it's just one whole sentence. And in this, in this verses one and two, uh, Christ is described by Peter as food that we taste. And then the next section 
in our, in our uh, lesson today, which is uh, verses 3 to 5, Peter is going to describe the Lord as a rock or as a stone that we come to. So let's begin with verse 1 that says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. As it is immediately evident as we read, this chapter begins again with the conjunction, therefore. And the meaning of this is that, it is, that Peter is connecting what he said at the end of chapter 1 with this new chapter. He said that we have been begotten by God by the power of his word. He said that we have been born again, that we are a new creation in Christ, and that we have been made spiritually alive with new desires and the new abilities to believe and to love and to obey God. He also said that as a consequence of all this, the Word of God must influence, the Word of God must impact every aspect of our lives. If you are born again, this new birth must be evident in your life. This is not an option. This is a requirement. If you're a believer, it must show in what you do. So, all believers are called to be holy. We are called to be different than the world around us. And one of the things that we saw that makes us different than the world is our love for the brethren our love for one another. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So by the end of this chapter one of Peter, the apostle intensifies the command to love one another by saying fervently, intensely, love one another from the heart intensely and sincerely. That's how you should love one another. So that's, that's how Peter ends the previous chapter. So now here, in order for us to do exactly that, that Peter is, is uh, telling us to do, Peter says that we must put aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Now, in this verse of chapter two, there is a Greek participle, apothemenoi, which has the force of an imperative. It is not an imperative, but that's how it is translated. And, and, and it, it literally means to take off clothes or your robes or whatever you're wearing, take, take off. So the idea here is to read oneself of all the sinful attitudes and behaviors because these attitudes, these sinful behaviors are contrary to love. So Peter gives us a list of five such behaviors. He begins with the Greek noun kakian, which is translated as malice. So the idea of this noun is, is that of a vicious attitude. It's uh, ill will or is malignity. So you, you, you grasp the, 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 the gravity of the word. It can also be used for evil or wickedness. So needless to say, this sentiment this attitude of, of malice or, or wickedness quenches love for one another. It destroys harmony and fellowship among the brethren. Love and malice are mutually exclusive. You cannot have them both at the same time. Next comes deceit and hypocrisy. And these two terms are closely related to one another because they refer to speaking or acting with ulterior motives or selfish motives. And, and these terms also refer to um, insincerity or uh, dishonesty or falsehood. So evidently these behaviors of course have no place in the life of a believer because they are inconsistent with the standard of truthfulness and honesty of speech and action that we are demanded from the scriptures. So also contrary to love are envy and slander. Now envy, is that sentiment or the thoughts that do not wish or seek the best of others or for others. Instead, it hopes for the downfall of other people. It hopes for their demise. And then slander, of course, is the communication of false and malicious statements that damage the, repu the reputation of another person. So as you can see, you know, these, these things are, are awful. And that's why Peter is saying, get rid of those things. So. For 
some of us that might need some more clarification here, what would this look like in our regular lives? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that you're having a conversation out here with a group of people, and, and Billy, who's the guy that gives the announcements every, every week, Billy shows up and joins the conversation. And then when you see Billy, you greet him and you take the advantage, uh, advantage of the opportunity to compliment Billy for his wittiness. And you compliment him for his funny jokes and for his highly fashionable dark brown shoes. And you are buttering up Billy for all these things while he's in front of you. But as soon as Billy leaves with, Tori, I mean with, uh, with his wife and turns around, you unload an unholy number of vicious criticism against poor old Billy. That is how this looks like in real life. This, is, this would be hip hypocrite. It would be deceitful how you slandered him when he's not around. Now, hypocrisy, deceit, envy, and slander can and should be expected from those who belong to this evil world system. The, the, this, these people who are unredeemed will always act according to their nature. They are unredeemed. They are lost. They do not know any better. However, those who belong to Christ are required to always speak in truth and love for one another. That's the point that we're seeing here. Believers are called to be different than the world. We are called to behave as redeemed people in Christ. Now, Paul agreed with Peter when he said in Ephesians 4, he said this, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and, put, and, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness, holiness of the truth. What the apostles are telling us in these two verses is that believers must rid themselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, that we must take off those nasty, sinful rags that once defined our lives, and we must now put on the garments of goodness and truth and honesty, generosity, and encouragement. Get rid of that sin and put on the fruit of the Spirit. That's, in essence, what they're saying. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old thing passed away, and the new things have come. This is why we're called to behave different. We are new in Christ. We are not those people anymore that, was, that belong to the world. We are new. We are different. We need to behave as such. Now, in verse 2, Peter tells us that reading ourselves of sinful and unloving practices is essential. It is essential for our spiritual growth. He says in verse 2, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Now, first let me tell you that Peter here is not implying that these believers in Asia uh, uh, Minor to whom, to whom he's uh, speaking are either immature or they are new in the faith. That, that is not at all what is happening. He's not criticizing them. He's not making any negative remarks. Peter is using this metaphor to illustrate the dependence that believers have upon God for everything in their lives. Now, as most of us know, newborn babies do have a legitimately strong and instinctive longing for their mother's milk. Why? Well, because their, their physical nourishment depends on it. I mean, this is how they, they get all their nutrients, through their mother's milk. In fact, I remember when, when we first went to the doctor with our babies, one of the first questions that I thought it was kind of strange was the doctor, the, one of the first things that they asked is like, how well is he feeding and how's his appetite? And I was thinking, before you do anything, this is what you're asking me. And later I understood, because I was explained, that the doctor asked these questions because this is a sign of a healthy baby. A hungry baby is a healthy baby. So just like newborn babies have a longing for their mother's milk, for their physical nourishment, believers also must long for the pure milk of the word. 
in this verse, this uh, uh, verb long for is an imperative. And it conveys the idea of having a strong desire. It implies a strong need for something. And you might ask, well, strong need for what? What is that something that you're speaking of? For unadulterated, uncontaminated word of God. The word of God is the means by which all of us believers are spiritually nourished. So the point here is that all believers must long for the spiritual nourishment that comes from the Word of God in the same way that a baby longs for his mother's milk, because we are dependent on it. The baby's life is dependent on the mother's milk. Our spiritual well-being is dependent on the Word of God. Now, here someone may ask, okay, so how is it that we, quote unquote, drink of the pure milk of the Word, because I, I cannot I cannot drink this book. I mean, how, how do we do that? Well, the answer, of course, is twofold. First, we do this through the study and meditation upon the Bible. And, and, and I know I say this a lot, but, but it needs to be said, this is the way it goes. We, we need to study and meditate upon the scriptures because the word of God must be read constantly. It must be lived fully and it must be obeyed unconditionally. Now, the second thing, the second part of this answer is that we drink the pure milk of the word when we listen to the word of God preached. Now, through the years, many of you know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but through the years, the people of Believer's Chapel have been blessed with many things. And a couple of those things include a fairly long list of great expositors of the Word of God, together with godly and faithful elders who make sure that the whole counsel of God is preached from these lecterns or from that pulpit. And here one may wonder, why are the elders so vigilant? Why are they so particular about the content and the quality of the preaching? Well, the answer is this, because the preaching of the Word is essential for the spiritual nourishment of the congregation. It is spiritual it is essential for all of you and all of us. That is why they are so particular about the quality of the instruction. This is what Mr. Duncan said in regard to this issue. He said, a Christian should not settle for anything less than the word of God and should demand that from their teachers. That's a strong word. You should demand that from us. He continues, and if they do not get it from this lectern, from this pulpit, they should go elsewhere where they will be fed and nourished and built up in the faith. It is our responsibility to give you the pure word of God to the best of our ability, to preach the full counsel of God. And it is your right and your responsibility to demand it from us. That's in essence what Dan is saying. And if you don't get it here, you need to go somewhere where you're gonna get that. Now, unfortunately, there are a great number of people, including some that call themselves believers, who choose not to read the Bible. Some may just be lazy, some may be just careless, some, some they just think that they are too busy, and they might in fact be too busy for this, and they don't read the Bible. Now, there are others who simply do not trust that what the Bible says is, uh, is actually true. They doubt that the Bible is actually the written, God's written revelation about himself. And yet there are others who just simply don't like what it says. So it makes them uncomfortable. And as a consequence, some have decided to just flat out ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist. And while some others have decided to make some changes to it in order to make it more agreeable to their beliefs. So they would read it, but they would just switch things here and there so that it fits their, their thoughts. And when, when someone does this, this is like adding sawdust to a burger patty. Now, think about it. It may be very filling, but it's not nutritious at all, and it is potentially damaged to eat that quote-unquote burger. So what you and I must remember here is that 
All scripture is inspired by God and therefore it is sufficient. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to modify it. We don't need to remove anything from it. Just like those who can tell the difference between real meat and beyond meat, this plant-based meat, those who have believed the word of God, those who understand it, those who have experienced its goodness, they can tell when it has been diluted, when it has been changed. They can tell this is no, no, no longer pure, and they don't like it, just like you wouldn't like a, a, a fake burger. So our spiritual growth then occurs through the diligent study of the scriptures. And this means that no matter how mature we are or we think we are in the faith, we are always in need for the Word of God. We are always and absolutely dependent on the Lord, just like a baby is absolutely dependent on his parents. That's our reality. That's what Peter is telling us here. Now, in the next verse, Peter encourages his readers to reflect on their previous experience with the Lord. Verse 3 begins with a Greek conjunction, a, which is a conditional marker that can be translated as if or since. So the NASB translated as if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now another acceptable translation is since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And I like this translation better because it makes it a little bit more clear what Peter is saying. And what Peter is doing is, is here. He's not questioning whether these believers in Asia Minor had actually tasted the kindness of the Lord. This is not saying, well, if you have done it, no. No. He's saying, since you have done it, Peter is assuming that they have. So he's making the point, And for, to make his point is he's using uh, Psalm 34, which says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. This is what Peter is alluding to, Psalm 34. And this psalm is praising God in the context of affliction, in the context of deliverance from fears, and in the context of salvation from difficulties. So this is what's in Peter's mind. And this psalm encourages believers to trust, to trust that the Lord will provide for all their needs. And with this, you may be wondering, okay, well, so how exactly is that Psalm 34 is relating it to 1 Peter chapter 2? Well, the answer is this. Remember, Peter's readers are undergoing some tremendous persecution from the Roman Empire. And the apostle Peter knows this, that these believers are going through some big trials and some major difficulties. They are in severe affliction. So, what Peter is doing here, he's reminding them that they have also experienced deliverance from fear, that they have also experienced salvation. And as a result of these things, they now have a reverential fear and trust in the Lord. So what Peter is doing is he's encouraging and strengthening these believers by reminding them of how they have tasted, of how they have experienced the goodness, the kindness of the Lord through the scriptures. So the more that we read and the better we understand the Bible, the more we will taste of the Lord's kindness. That is the point. The Word of God gives peace, gives order, gives direction to the lives of those who believe it and obey it. That will be us. This is this right here. This is why the world is falling apart. Our society is determined to move deeper and deeper into darkness, further and further away from God. Men and women desire peace, and they look everywhere for it except in Christ. These people walk aimlessly through life. They obey their selfish desires rather than their God-given conscience. They worship creation instead of the creator. They worship self rather than God. They reject the truth and embrace man-made fantasies. And many are convinced that they can and that they must live their lives however they want because they are accountable to no one but themselves. And to make matters worse, there are churches 
or I should say pseudo-churches, who indulge these ideas. Churches who have diluted the Word of God to make it more palatable, to make it more appealing, or to make it less threatening to the world. And these pseudo-churches offer you everything, everything and anything that would keep you and your family entertained and feeling great about yourselves. The problem is that there is no spiritual nourishment in amenities, in programs, or in fun activities. Those are just burgers made completely of sawdust, sprinkled with uh, a little bit of, of beef. This is, this is angel cake here. It's not satisfying. And as Dan mentioned in the past, those who have tasted the kindness of the Lord will not be satisfied with anything less than the, un the, than the un unadulterated Word of God. Believers will long for God's Word. It is our spiritual sustenance. We cannot get enough of it. We want it. We need it constantly. And therefore, we're going to do whatever we need to do to seek it. Even if I have to drive 45 minutes to the restaurant, I am going to go there because I'm going to be fed, which is the experience of many here. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, verse 4 now begins a new section. And here in this section, Peter continues to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, but now he describes Christ as a stone or a rock that we come to. Verse 4 says, And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but it is choice and precious in the sight of God. Now here the verb coming is a present participle that describes something that is happening continually, that is something that keeps happening. So the phrase coming to him refers to those who come to Christ in faith. That will be us believers. It speaks of the moment when we are once and forever joined to Christ, our Redeemer. And just to piggyback a little bit on the example that I was giving you a couple of weeks ago, for me, this moment when I was first joined to Jesus Christ once and forever, I forgot to mention this, that's why I'm mentioning it now. That moment happened on a Thursday night, driving my red Mustang, which a lot of people had, <laughs> had mentioned something about that car. I was riding that red Mustang on southbound 75, coming back from that ministry group meeting. That's when it happened to me. That's where it happened. That's why the car was kind of special besides the other sinful things. But this is the most special thing. So the idea behind this phrase of coming to him is the expansion of the church, the expansion of the brotherhood in the world. It speaks about believers who keep coming to Christ in faith, one after another, one after another. So in other words, the church is built up and it is fashioned into a spiritual house as more and more of us come into faith with Christ. So what we have in this verse is yet another metaphor to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter calls him here a living stone. And here it is very possible that Peter was thinking about the death and resurrection of Christ. The phrase coming to him as to a living stone presupposes that Christ is not only alive, He's living, but that he's also the source of life, that he is the one and only giver of life. So he himself is alive. He himself is the source of life, and he's the only one that can give you life. That's the presupposition here. Now, Peter also tells us two things about this living stone. The first one is that this living stone was rejected by men. Peter most likely is referencing Psalm 118, verse 22, where the stone rejected by the builders later becomes the cornerstone. Peter also referenced this same Psalm 118 in Acts chapter 4, where he spoke about the death and resurrection and glorification of Jesus Christ. And the point that he was making back in Acts was that the Jewish religious leaders demonstrated their utter rejection. They demonstrated their hatred for Christ by putting him on the cross, by killing him. But God made Christ the chief cornerstone by raising him from the dead. So you see here the contrast between the Pharisees 
and God, two different opinions, but one of those actually matters, one of those actually prevails. Now, something very interesting and sad here is that this phrase, rejected by men, implies that the builders, that these men, examined the living stone, all right? They took a very close look at it. They inspected it closely, and they rejected it because they determined that this rock did not meet their quality standards for building. They thought they knew better than God, and they said, this is not useful, and they discarded him. The second thing that Peter says about this living stone is that it is choice and precious in the sight of God. This is what I was telling you about the contrast between the Pharisees and God. Jesus was rejected by fallen men, by finite men, while the holy God of the universe glorified him. So this was... This knowledge was definitely a most welcoming encouragement for these believers in Asia Minor who were experiencing rejection from people around them. The life of Christ served as a pattern in which these believers could see that while they were despised and rejected by many, just as the Lord was, they were also chosen and honored by God, just like Jesus was. And one day, these believers will be vindicated after all their suffering, just as Jesus was. So, the point here is that we are in Christ. Wherever he goes, we go. Whatever his fate is our fate. And this is the encouragement of the future for us. So, the lesson, there's a, there's a lesson here for us who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and we experience rejection like they did. So we need to understand, first of all, why is this rejection? Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And then he says, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. And then he says in the same chapter, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So... These times of difficulty and rejection and persecution are coming. You can see it out there. You can see it in, in, the, in the news cycle. They're coming, and then we must prepare, be prepared for that. So what we need to know, what we need to remember, every time I hear something like this, it, it makes me nervous. Because I don't know how this is going to look like, and I don't want to have to go through that, but I know that, that I, I might. So the encouragement that I want to give you is that we are not left without hope. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5 says, All of us, meaning all of us believers, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Wherever Christ goes, we will go. He was resurrected and glorified, and we will be resurrected and glorified. One day, all of us believers will be vindicated for our suffering, that is the encouragement. That is our certain hope for the future. So be encouraged. Now, in the next verse, Peter tells us that those who belong to Christ are also precious to God. He said in verse 5, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is what makes us believers, makes us living stones. And in him, in Christ, we have new life. And as I was saying, we have a certain hope of resurrection in the future. Nowhere else in the scriptures, believers are called living stones. This is the only place where we are called living stones. Elsewhere, Paul and the author of Hebrews refer to believers as the temple of God or the, uh, 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 God's house, but not living stones. This is only Peter. Now, 
unlike regular stones, living stones, of course, are alive and we're active and our purpose is to serve the Lord as we're going to see in just a few moments. Now, in this verse, the noun house alludes, of course, to the temple that was built by Solomon, which is commonly uh, referred to in the Old Testament as, as, as house, as the house of God. And this beautiful, magnificent temple was full of God's presence. This was the place where God symbolically dwelled among his people. But that physical temple is gone. And Peter now identifies the church as God's new temple. The church is God's new dwelling place. The idea here is that all believers are individual living stones that together are forming God's house. All believers together, one by one, as God brings us to faith in Christ, are forming the church. So this new spiritual house, of course, is presently under construction. It is not finished. And we must not believe when I say that we form the church, that we are building it ourselves. We are not building it ourselves. God is the one who is building. And he's doing that as we speak. We're just placed. He places us in wherever he wants in his house. And this new house, of course, is not physical. This is not a building. It is spiritual because it is being formed by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. In other words, God is the builder, and believers are the stones. And every time a new believer comes to faith in Christ, God adds this new stone to the building. So this house, this building, which is presently under construction, of course, is the church, and God lives inside this house through the Holy Spirit who indwells all of us, which are the living stones. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says that believers are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us individually through the Holy Spirit. And that's why together we are being made into the house of God, and that's how God lives in us. It's like if God lived in, if, if one of us lived individually in each and every one of those bricks. That's, the, that's the, the idea here. Now, the purpose of this building, uh, of this house, is to function as a, ro a holy priesthood. If you remember, in the Old Testament, only the Levitical priests were qualified to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And only the high priest, who was a Levite, could access the Holy of Holies once a year to offer a sacrifice. There, there was a, it, this is a requirement. It's all over Leviticus. So those days of the Levitical order of priests came to an end when Jesus died and resurrected. So those days are gone. Now, these duties that once belonged exclusively to the, to the Levitical priests now belong to all believers. In Christ, all believers are priests. All believers have immediate and direct access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And all believers are welcome and encouraged and able to bring other people to the Lord. In fact, Hebrews 4 Chapter 6, uh, uh, verse 16, urges, urges us believers to approach the throne of grace and to do it often and will, with boldness and with confidence. No Levitical priest ever was allowed to do this, not even in their wildest dreams. They're, they had to follow a procedure. As priests, we offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Back in the Old Testament, as I was saying, the Levitical priest had to do things, quote-unquote, by the book. They offered sacrifices of prayer, of thanksgiving, of praise, and repentance. But now, in the New Testament times, the spiritual sacrifices consist of the offering of our bodies, like Romans 12 says. They consist of uh, our financial gifts to the church, or to missionaries so that they can continue spreading the gospel. It is also the money that we give to other saints in need or to people who need it. Um, we see in Hebrews 13 that uh, spiritual um, sacrifices are also praises to God. And we also know that love and service to other people are also spiritual sacrifices. So in essence, anything we do with our bodies, 
and with our resources, whether it is our intellect, our physical ability, our money, or our time, anything of those, days, of those things that we do, our spiritual sacrifices, if they're op offered up to God. And these sacrifices are acceptable to God through the mediation of Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest. Now, last time, when I was here with you, I was mentioning my professor's theory of how Old Testament people, Moses, Joseph, you name it, Joshua, the heroes of the faith, the forefathers, and people in general in the Old Testament are going to be very curious, are going to be more curious about you than you would be about them because our experience was radically different. I mean, look at this, what happened with the Levitical order. We now have unrestricted access to the Father. Anytime you need to talk to him, you just do it. You don't have to go to the priest and say, hey, can you tell him? You go to him directly. You need him, you talk to him. You want to communicate with him, you read the Bible. You can pray. No problem. The Leviticals, Le uh, Levitical order didn't have that. People in the Old Testament were not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We are. They did not have the full revelation of God. They did not have the whole scriptures. We do. So they are going to want to know how was it to be able to speak directly to God every time you wanted. I want to know how was your experience. That may not happen, but it's, it's fun to think about that. But the point here is that this direct and unrestricted access to the Father is a privilege that is beyond our comprehension. I can speak to you about it, and I can try to explain it to you with my examples, but I don't think we can fully comprehend the magnitude of this blessing. We cannot fully appreciate its importance. This is why we need to meditate upon these things. The more we meditate about these things, the more we realize that we don't really know much about the Lord, and we are thankful for everything that He has done. And all of this knowledge, all, all of these humbling uh, uh, revelations are here in the Scriptures, and they're ready to just be read by us. So I encourage you, come to listen to the Word preached. Get involved in a Bible study. Read your Bible. It's not because I want numbers. It's not that I have a quote of people to put in the classroom. That's not at all what's happening. What I want is what is best for you. You need the Word of God, and we have it right here. Our spiritual growth depends on it. That's what we're here for. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to serve your people. We thank you, Lord, most importantly for the revelation we have in our hands, which we know comes from you, and it is true, and it's sufficient, and it's everything we need to do, and everything we need to, to know in order to live according to your will. So, Father, would you give us an, uh, uh, a desire to, to draw closer to you through listening to the word preached, through reading the scriptures, teaching it to our children, sharing it with those who are around us. Lord, we ask you that you would bless us, as we are forgetful, and, and I am weak, and sometimes I just don't want to do it. So, Lord, we need, we need you to give us a change of heart that we actually do long for your word. So, Lord, would you bless us as we do that? Bless Dan as he preaches in a moment. And most of all, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who, who came to die on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen.